Christine. I know we've talked a lot about Carpenter this season, but Carpenter is just, I know I said it, I believe in the last episode when we were talking about The Thing, he's the H.P. Lovecraft of a generation. He catapulted so many stories onto film and made them all so iconic. And Christine is definitely no exception to that. The story behind Christine starts with Richard Kobritz. He was the producer of the film. He had previously produced the miniseries for Salem's Lot, which is also, of course, based on a Stephen King novel. Through his work on Salem's Lot, he became really acquainted with Stephen King, and he had been sent two manuscripts of his upcoming novels, Cujo and Christine. Kobritz was really attached to Christine after he read the novel, so he purchased the rights to it right away, even before the novel had even came out. So he knew he was going to do a film adaptation on it, and his first choice for director was John Carpenter. But he was initially unavailable, because he was currently making the film uh, Firestarter, and he was doing The Ninja. But both of these films had production delays, which allowed him to accept the director position for Christine after all. Carpenter had also said that Christine wasn't a film he had planned on directing, saying that he directed the film more so as a job instead of a personal project. Because of the poor box office success and the critical backlash from The Thing, Carpenter said that he felt Christine just wasn't very frightening, but it was something that he needed to do at that time for his career. So to think that John Carpenter was facing backlash and felt that he had to do Christine for his career because The Thing was received so poorly. Yet now The Thing is considered one of the greatest special effects movies of all time. Wow. It's, it's amazing how sometimes, you know, even as content creators, directors, filmmakers, what have you, you don't know at the time what you're putting out. You know, when you create content, you don't know for sure how that content's going to land with an audience. You don't. But you also don't know when it's going to land with an audience. Because you could, I could put a podcast episode out next Tuesday, this podcast episode. I don't expect anybody to listen. I never, honestly, I never expect anyone to listen to my podcast. But when people do, I am so grateful. But who knows, two, three, four, five years down the line, this episode may have half a million views out of fucking nowhere. I'm not going into this thinking I'm going to get a half a million views. And it's the same thing John Carpenter did when he went into Christine. He wasn't expecting to make an iconic horror classic, but at the end of the day, he did. Same with The Thing. He was going in there probably expecting to make a, you know, a successful movie, and it wasn't. But decades later, The Thing is now a successful movie. So now they had a director attached to the movie, and casting began underway. Columbia Pictures initially wanted to cast Brooke Shields in the role of Lee because of her publicity after the release of The Blue Lagoon in 1981. They also wanted to cast Scott Bayo as Arnie, but the filmmakers declined this suggestion, opting to cast young actors who were still fairly unknown. Fun fact, Kevin Bacon auditioned for the lead role, but he opted out of it when he was offered the lead in Footloose. So think about it, if Kevin Bacon wasn't in Footloose, there's a pretty big chance he would have had the starring role in Christine. So Carpenter cast Keith Gordon in the role of Arnie after an audition in New York City. Gordon had some experience in film and he was also working in theater at the time, which made him a fit for Arnie. 19-year-old Alexandra Paul was also cast in the film after an audition in New York City as well. And according to Carpenter, Paul was an untrained young actress at the time, but brought a great quality to the character of Lee. And the actress also hadn't read any of King's books or seen any of John Carpenter's films, but read the Christine novel to prepare for the role. Christine was mostly shot in Los Angeles, California, while the location for Darnell's Garage was located in Santa Clarita. Filming commenced in April of 1983, just mere days after the novel had been published. So, like, they're filming and making a movie before they know if anyone's actually even going to like the story. But it's Stephen King. They had high hopes. There was an abandoned furniture factory in Irwindale, which was used for the opening scene of the film. And the stunts in the film were primarily completed by the stunt coordinator Terry Leonard, who was behind the wheel of the car during the high-speed chase scenes, as well as the scene in which the car drives down a highway engulfed in flames. During that same scene, Leonard wore a Nomex firefighter suit complete with a breathing apparatus so that he could obviously survive it. Now, speaking of the car in the film... It's identified as a 1958 Plymouth Fury, and in 1983 radio ads promoting the film, there was voiceover artists that said she's a 57 Fury, but there were actually two other Plymouth models that were used, the Belvedere and the Savoy. They were actually also used to portray the malevolent automobile on screen. 
total production for the 1958 Plymouth Fury was only 5,303, and they were difficult to find and totally expensive to buy at the time. In addition to this, the real-life Furies only came in one color, which was sandstone white with a buckskin beige interior. And some of King's details about the car were incorrect in the novel, so they had to try to find a way to make it correct in real life. The 1956-1958 Plymouth Fury was only available as a two-door coupe, while the book described it as a four-door sedan, which would have made it a Savoy or Belvedere model. And during Lee's choking scene, Christine is shown to have common vertical lock buttons on the inside door panels. Chrysler vehicles of this area, though, were not equipped with such buttons, because to lock the door, the door handle has to be pushed downward. King also mentions in the book that a shift lever is used for automatic transition, but in real life it, the car had push-button controls. So there was a lot that they had to do to make it accurate to the book while accurate to real life at the same time. So it's quite interesting the uh, song and dance that they had to do to make this happen. Originally, Carpenter hadn't planned to film the car's regeneration scenes. He gave special effects supervisor Roy Arbogast three weeks to devise a way for the car to rebuild itself. So Arbogast and his team made rubber molds from one of the cars, which included a whole front end. One of the cars was stripped of its engine to accommodate internally mounted hydraulics that pulled the framework inward, which crumpled the car, with the shot then run backwards in the final film to make it look like it was regenerating. 23 cars in total were used in Christine. Initially, they were sold as scrap metal when the filming ended, but one of the best-known surviving vehicles was rescued from the junkyard and restored. It was bought by collector Bill Gibson of Pensacola, Florida. So Christine released in North America on December 9th, 1983 in 1,045 theaters, and in its opening weekend did pretty good, brought in $3,408,904. But it dropped in its second weekend, grossing only $2,058,517. The total gross for Christine at the end of the day was $21,017,849. It was then released on VHS by Columbia Pictures, and DVD copies came out on August 4th, 1998, and later a special edition was released on DVD in 2004. Now, without further ado, we're going to head into this John Carpenter classic and talk about Christine. The film starts by showing us a red and white 1958 Plymouth Fury, and it's being built on the assembly line. A worker is inspecting the engine when the car injures him by closing its hood on the worker's hand. During closing time, another worker gets killed in the Fury when he flicks cigar ash on its upholstery. We then fast forward 20 years later. We meet Arnold Arnie Cunningham. He's a nerdy teen who buys the same used Fury coupe that we saw at the beginning of the film here, despite the fact that his friend objects to the purchase at all. His friend Dennis says that the car's going to need a full restoration and it's just going to be too much work. Arnie ends up going to school and we see that he's being viciously bullied by someone named Buddy who is expelled after drawing a switchblade. Arnie heads back to his car and begins restoring the Fury, which is named Christine, and as he's spending time repairing it, he starts to change. He sheds his glasses, he starts dressing better, and starts developing this cocky arrogance to himself. He starts getting an obsession with Christine, and it begins putting a strain on his relationship with his parents, as well as his friendship with Dennis. Dennis asks out the new girl in town, Lee. Dennis ends up asking out the new girl, Lee, but finds out she already has a date. As Arnie continues to go through these changes, Dennis returns to the cellar of Christine to ask more details about the car. He discovers that the previous owner of the car was obsessed with Christine, despite the fact that his family had died in the car, and later, he had ended up killing himself in it as well. Later on, Lee and Arnie attend one of Dennis's football games, and Dennis not only sees them together, but also sees that Christine is completely restored. This distracts him, and he becomes gravely injured. Arnie ends up visiting him in the hospital and learns that he was almost paralyzed and he's never going to be able to play football again. Lee and Arnie, their relationship starts to bud, it's going well, until they attend a drive-in movie. Lee explains that she's uncomfortable having sex in the car. Arnie starts to coax her into it and rub her back, but the car's radio spontaneously turns on and a blinding light emits from the dash. Lee starts to choke on her food, and Arnie discovers that the doors have locked. Lee unlocks the doors, and another patron at the drive-in ends up saving her. So then we see the bully Buddy again. And he's with his friends Moochie, Richie, and Don. 
they decide they're going to vandalize Christine in retaliation for Buddy's expulsion. Arnie ends up seeing the carnage, and Lee tries to console Arnie when he lashes out at her and breaks up with her. Arnie later returns to the garage and promises Christine that he's going to rebuild her, and as he starts to walk away, he starts to hear the sound of creaking metal and sees that the engine is fully restored. At his command, Christine then begins to restore herself to showroom quality. Later that evening, Christine chases Moochie into a corner and kills him. Arnie, of course, gets questioned by Detective Rudy Junkins, who says that Moochie got what he deserved. He's eventually let go, of course, because Arnie's alibi checks out. Christine then continues her murderous rampage and begins to target Buddy and Richie. Christine chases them to a gas station where Don works and rams Buddy's car into the gas station, which kills Richie. Buddy escapes the gas tank explosion that kills Don, but Christine, while still on fire, decides to run down Buddy. The smoldering car heads back to Darnell's garage, and Darnell investigates it when the car crashes him in a seat. The police end up finding Darnell's body inside the car, which is, again, in like new condition. And of course, Arnie gets questioned again, who becomes angry and provides an alibi. Lee no longer wants anything to do with this and knows that Christine is having some sort of negative impact on Arnie, so she requests help from Dennis to destroy Christine. Dennis scratches Darnell's Tonight into Christine's hood and leaves for the garage to hotwire Darnell's bulldozer. They plan to lure Christine into the garage and destroy her, but she surprises them by emerging from a pile of scrap metal. Lee flees while Dennis runs interference, and after sideswiping another car, Arnie is revealed to be driving Christine the entire time. While trying to kill Lee, Christine crashes into Darnell's office and Arnie flies through Christine's windshield. As he tries to grab Lee, she sees that he's mortally wounded and before he dies, Arnie reaches out to touch Christine. Lee ends up exiting the wreckage of the office to tell Dennis that Arnie's dead, but Christine, mourning the loss of her owner, continues attacking and regenerates faster than before. Dennis pulls Lee into the bulldozer's cab and then repeatedly smashes Christine with the bulldozer. They return to the junkyard the next day and see that Christine's body is completely crushed into a cube. Detective Junkins joins them and attempts to console them, congratulating them for stopping Christine, even though, of course, you know, they were unable to save Arnie. And they get momentarily spooked when they hear a 1950s rock and roll song turn on, but it turns out to be a workman's boombox. However, Christine's grill slowly twitches as if she's saying, I'll be back. Many people have actually made comparisons between Halloween Ends and Christine, saying that Corey Cunningham mirrors Arnie in a lot of ways because he gets the totem in a sense, right? Like Arnie has the car, Corey got the mask. And once they got those totems, they were changed in a sense, right? They had more confidence, their personalities changed, they went a different direction in life. The two of those characters mirror in, the, in a way of their journey, if you know what I mean, right? A lot of people mentioned that, and I agree with that comparison. There's definitely comparisons between Corey Cunningham and Arnie, which makes complete sense at the end of the day, right? Like, if you're going to pay homage to the guy who created Halloween, John Carpenter, you're probably going to try and put some of his other works in there, too, that are iconic at the same time. My personal thoughts on Christine is, it's okay. It's a good horror movie. Like, I like it. It's all right. It's not something I would say is necessarily, you know, up there with the greats. It's not one of Carpenter's best movies. I would say it's definitely a forgotten classic as well, but I wouldn't say it's a hidden gem. I don't necessarily think it's a hidden gem. It's a forgotten classic, but it's a good movie at the end of the day. You know, if you haven't seen it and you're a fan of Stephen King's stories, you should watch Christine. It's a good film overall, and they did a good job of executing Stephen King's vision despite the inaccuracies in the book. Thanks again, guys, for tuning into this episode on the Cabin of Horrors podcast. If you haven't already, I would really appreciate it if you gave my podcast a rate and review. Wherever you're listening to this, whether it be on Outcast, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Samsung, wherever you're listening to this, please rate and review my podcast because it really helps me get out there, get more people seeing the podcast. And hell, you may even allow someone to find my podcast that... Uh, would really like it so also check me out on instagram instagram.com slash cabin of horrors podcast and i don't think i mentioned this the patreon is now live cabin of horrors is now live on patreon we have two subscription tiers we have one for three dollars a month canadian and five dollars a month canadian both of them will give you access to patreon exclusive podcast episodes where the higher tier will give you early access to the upcoming horror project nightmare on the 13th which 
I am so excited to share with you guys. I can't share more right now, but I can't wait until I do. It's going to be great. So yeah, come follow me on Instagram if you want to stay up to date on everything Cabin of Horrors. I'll be back with a brand new episode. However, it's going to be the beginning of this season's franchise review. We're going to 1984. I wonder what franchise started in 1984. I guess you're going to have to do some research because you find that answer and you will know what we are reviewing for our franchise and review for this season starting next week. <laughs> See you in the shadows.